Welcome, welcome back to 98366 Networking Fundamentals. Christopher Chapman, say hi Christopher. Hi, how's it going? How's everybody doing? Hopefully still with us. Thomas Willingham, we're here to talk about understanding wired and wireless networks. So we have discussed previously the OSI model. Now we're gonna talk about the layer one, physical layer, and we're gonna talk about wired and wireless networking. So if we look at, again, the skills and concepts for this, we're gonna talk about recognizing wired networks and media types and comprehending wireless networks. So let's just dive right into it. First of all, we have twisted pair cable. Twisted pair cable is the most commonly used cable type in local area networks. Uh, relatively easy to work with, flexible, efficient, and fast. Uh, contains eight wires grouped into four twisted pairs. The four twisted pairs are basically like blue, green, orange, and brown. Uh, and the twisted wires reduce crosstalk or noise and interference between the wires. Which we're going to talk about more in a little while. We will. Uh, this shows a graphic of what a twisted pair cable might look like with all the wires spread apart. Yeah, I so, thought about actually getting a cable. I mean, we have some in here. We could technically just, you know, cut one apart and show it on camera. But one, I'm not sure we have the zoom capabilities. I'd have to walk up to the camera with it and show it to everybody. And two, I don't know if the studio here would, you know, be that appreciate. appreciative of us cutting their cables up to show students a demonstration. Oh, that's good. That's the response I would have expected. We're not going to talk about what I just saw from the back of the room. <laughs> We, we received feedback from the back of the room. Uh, we'll just say it wasn't positive. It was more of a negative type of feedback. Apparently the graphic is going to have to do. Exactly. So let's go back to the graphic. <laughs> so we see the four twisted pairs here, blue, green, orange, and brown. Uh, typically, this is just the cable. You're probably more used to seeing a jack on the end of this. Uh, but all these wires are kind of moved apart. They're, they're separated, they're shoved into the jack, and then you use tools to basically crimp that down. We'll talk about those tools in a minute. Twisted pair categories. So there's different categories of twisted pair. And this basically rates the speed that can go over that category. So we have category three, 10 megabits per second. Uh, category five, cat five, and typically you just say cat five, cat it, three. You may have heard that term or will hear that term in the future. Uh, cat five, 100 megabits per second. Cat six, ooh, 1,000 megabits per second plus. 1,000 plus. Plus, a plus is important. And then tools for twisted pair cabling. Uh, if you've basically done any type of this, you're very familiar with these. Uh, on the far left, the plier, looking things are strippers. Um, we can say that because we're referring to tools. Yes. Strippers. Yes, indeed. And basically what this does is strip the outer wiring off and allows us to get to the metal component within the wire. So uh, the jack you see kind of in the middle here above the tester, the jack, you basically take the bare wiring, shove it in there, and then crimp it. So to, to clarify real quick, the strippers we were talking about on the left side, these are the tools of a seasoned professional because it's not an actual wire stripper with a gauge on it that you put the wire in and it just pulls off the cladding because it's the right diameter. These are actually wire cutters. You got to spend some time just making sure you're cutting the sheath and not the wires inside. These are professional wire strippers is what I call these. Finesse. There's exactly. some finesse involved. Maybe a little frustration. I was actually going to say when this slide came up, you see that first tool on the right and... Uh, if you know what that tool is, you probably don't have fond, pleasant, joyful memories of using one ever. I do. Yeah? I, I have some love fun. Love some wire crimping? I, I love me some wire crimping. It was totally back in the day, but yeah, I've done my share. Uh, the next one over, the ones that have the little like thumb holder in it, uh, that is basically wire strippers for the rest of us. Yeah. So you can put the wire in here, and basically just close it, and it has already an offset of where it is. It'll just strip the cable off for you. Uh, the orange handled devices, uh, those are jack crimpers. So basically you can put that, the jack in there, you can put the wire in there, 
uh, punch it, and it just punches everything down. And then finally, in the middle, Christopher, what do we have in the middle? Tell oh, the have, audience what they've won. We have a cable tester. So once you've once you've taken a bare wire, pull it out of a box, pull it out of a wall, taken it out of your you know living room, connect to the computer because you want to try this at home, and you've cut the ends of it off with those with the clippers on the left, then you've stripped them down to just the bare wires, and you've got these little these little jack ends, these little connector ends in your hand, and you've separated out those pairs in the right order, which we're going to show you what the right order is here in a couple of minutes, and you've finagled those eight individual wires into that cable end just right, and you've stuck it into that crimp tool and you've crimped it down, and by this point, if you're me, you're in tears because this is bringing you back memories of hours of your life that you'll never get back. You can then take both ends of that cable you've just made and plug it into that box in the middle, and you push that button that says test, and then when those lights don't light up, you cry some more because you've got to cut the ends back off and try it all again. Hopefully, again, once you've spent those hours, and that's really, I think, like the earning your dues part of oh, IT. Oh, yeah, I think that's totally paying your once dues. Once you've created about a thousand of these cables, and you can spin up this process in about five minutes and plug that cable in and push that test button, and it lights up on both sides, you'll be happy that you'll never have to do it again. Well, and due to networking communication, it's very important that you have the appropriate red, blue, green uh, put in the jack correctly, and it's the same on both ends. Maybe. We're going to talk about that in a couple of minutes. True, Maybe. but typically, it's the same on both ends. Well, yeah, typically it is. We'll give you some, some bonus knowledge for those of you who want to go above and beyond in your potential current or future IT environments. Stay tuned Stay for tuned said bonus indeed. knowledge. So we have types of patch cables. We have straight through cables, and these are cables that I was referring to, the most common type. Uh, the wiring on both ends of the jack are exactly the same. Uh, one wire is for transmit, one wire is for receive, so the different wires have different functionality. Well, if you've ever, without a hub, tried to hook a computer directly to another computer, Christopher, what happens? Nothing. Typically, nothing. Because you if have... You're, if you're using one of these straight-through cables, nothing's going to happen. So this relates to the next slide, although we're going to kind of back and forth here for a minute with some of the slide material. If I plug one computer into another cable with a regular straight-through patch, or one computer into another computer with one straight-through cable, I'm not going to get any connectivity. Those computers don't have the right kinds of ports on them to accommodate that setup. So I need to create what's called a crossover cable. I need to take, and a little more bonus knowledge, again, for all this trivia in the parties you have with your geek friends, um, of an eight-wire unshielded twisted pair cable like we're talking about, only four of those wires are actually used by most NICs. Um, those wires are in pairs, and to create a crossover cable, you build one end the normal way, and then you build the other end with the two pairs reversed. And that's called a crossover cable. You can plug that into two computers directly, no hub, no switch, no other interconnecting devices, and communicate between those two computers as if you're on a regular network. So that's a little bit of the bonus information. You can make your own crossover cables, know when to use crossover cables. But the question that comes to me when I'm talking about this is, how come I can plug a cable into a switch and it works? Let's find out. So MDI, medium dependent interface, <clears throat> a type of ethernet port connection using twisted pair cabling. This allows computers to communicate with other devices and the wires have to cross somewhere, which is what Christopher was just talking about. Instead of using crossover cables for direct connect, there are also MDI X ports, medium dependent interface crossover. And these are ports that take care of the cross. So you can use a typical network cable, plug them into these MDI X ports and plug a device directly into another device. Now where this gets a little confusing is most switches these days are auto sensing. They'll actually have MDI and MDX. That, the reason we specify both, or we show you both here, is there used to be devices, switches, hubs, routers, that had specific MDIX ports on them that you would know you could plug a straight-through cable in and it would be a crossover. You could plug a crossover in and it would straighten it out and wouldn't really work for what you were trying to do. Most switches these days have auto-sensing ports that will be listed in their features. They know what kind of cable you're plugging in and if they do or don't need to make that electronic crossover for you. So we have ports. We also have patch panel and RJ45 wall jack. So now we're kind of getting into the behind the scenes networking. 
Uh, your patch panel is typically in your wiring closet um, and takes wiring and basically in a one-to-one -one fashion specifies a specific position on the patch panel to a specific wall jack. So wall jack in uh, Bob or Jane's office is associated to patch panel area five or, or patch panel port five. Mm -hmm. And you can see on these, they actually give you a little bit of assistance. Uh, and there may be times when people watching this video will have to actually build out closets or build patch panels that you're installing into an empty rack that aren't pre-cabled. You're actually going to be running this cable in your facility, so you're going to have to punch this down. Using another tool we're going to see in a couple of slides, you'll notice they help you out a little bit by putting colors on some of the points so you can know which wires go in which spots for colors to get that, that lineup correct. The one on the bottom, you can see, I don't know if you can see it, on the edge is where they kind of put that guide. They don't have room on the top, so it's down on the edge or even on the other side where you can't really see right now. So for the wall jack, basically here, and for the patch panel, here, 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 and here. And once again, Uber Geek Knowledge, if you want to impress your friends, learn the order of wires in a typical RJ45 connector in order, and then the crossover order. And then the friends will crawl out of the woodwork wanting your knowledge. You must be really popular you at don't. parties. You know, <laughs> I go outside all the time. <laughs> so we've talked about patch panels. We've talked about RJ45 jacks. We've talked about crimpers. Uh, the tools to make the cables. Here's some of the tools needed to create the patch panel and to create, um, to test some of those connections that we've made. Uh, RJ45 jacks, the cutting tool, the wire stripper, the punch down tool. We also have a continuity tester. So once you've created the cable or you've created the patch panel wall run, uh, you need to ensure that the cable didn't get crimped somehow. Uh, maybe your hand went crazy while you were using the stripper and you cut into the cable or something uh, midway, midpoint. Uh, the continuity tester will just verify that the cable works well. Yep. Pretty sure I've used that one too. So typically what you would do is at the wall jack, you would plug in. So if we look... Um, Actually, it took a second trying to figure out that picture, how all the pieces fit together. Yeah, so here, this is what you'd click into the wall jack, just so this represents the wall jack. This is what you'd click into the patch panel or the hub that's connected to the patch panel. This basically sends a signal. It bounces back off this and comes back, and then it tells you basically how good or bad a wiring job that you've done. So some things that we have to deal with as we basically do this physical cabling, or actually any network has to deal with this, physical or wireless, mm -hmm. attenuation. So attenuation is basically the signal degrading over distance. Yep. So as distance is, um, is, is traveled, uh, the signal becomes less. Uh, if you're a fan of the Big Bang at all, you'll know that uh, Sheldon for one Halloween dressed up as the Doppler effect. <laughs> and the Doppler effect basically being that as a device gets closer to you, it gets louder. As it goes further away from you, it uh, gets quieter. And that's kind of an example of attenuation as it gains further distance and that sound has to travel more distance to get to you, it's lower because of attenuation. And that's simplifying. And I'm sure there's somebody out there with a science degree who'll want to argue with me. Knock yourself out. I'm, I'm sure you're right. Um, yep, that's just feel, a really simple, basic explanation. Feel free to yell at this video all you want. <laughs> hey, yeah, we will, definitely. We will listen attentively. Exactly. You pause it. Pause it get, in a yeah. way that it makes like we're listening. Uh, in fact, maybe we'll set aside some area of the video that quality listening time. Sit here very attentively. Yeah, we'll both be like... And we might even nod knowingly. <laughs> so, you know. 
Because again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep that in mind. Actually, yeah, we're here for them. It's true, Christopher. This is all about them learning That's very and true. them getting what they need. So attenuation. Along with attenuation is interference, and interference is basically things that disrupt the signal or modifies the signal in some manner that travels along the wire, or this could also be a wireless mm -hmm. issue. Interference could be wired or wireless. Uh, interference could be caused by electrical sources, lights, electrical outlets, motors, appliances, uh, anything that uses an electrical signal of some kind or a wireless radio signal of some kind can be interfered with. Well, in the case of wireless, I'm thinking walls. Yeah, exactly. Hills, if you're not line of sight. Trees, cars, a lot of things. Uh, an example of interference, there was a teaching class. There was a student uh, who explained the circumstance to me, told me it took them a while to figure it out. You're going to like this. So every day between basically 7 and 9 and 3 and 6, their network would degrade considerably. It, it would degrade really, really bad. What they found was their wiring closet was right by the elevators. So during peak traffic time, when people are going up and down the elevators, the elevators would cause interference are, with their network signal. Those are big motors. Yep, yep. So you never know where interference is going to come from. And troubleshooting, which we're not going to really deal with here, but troubleshooting is an art. I mean, people think there's science, and there is science to it, but you got to be really creative and really think outside of the box because nowhere is there going to be a checkbox that says check elevators by your patch yep, panel. Nope, that is not going to be on our troubleshooting list anywhere. EMI, electromagnetic interference. Uh, disturbance can affect electrical circuits, devices, and cables due to electromagnetic conduction and possibly radiation. I like that this says possibly radiation. I'm pretty sure if that's an issue, I'm not going to worry that much about troubleshooting it. I'm going to worry more about leaving. Yeah, yeah. When you, when you see radiation, I'm not thinking, oh, I wonder if I got good network signal. I wonder why the signal's so degraded. Huh, I'd be thinking, why am I glowing? It's time to get out. <laughs> Uh, any type of electrical devices can create uh, EMI, TVs, air conditioning units, motors, unshielded electrical cabling. Um, the best example I have of this is not a networking example, but it is a data example. Uh, again, dating myself, 10, 15 years ago when we were using phones still, those, those phones plugged into the wall, and they were wireless, they were cordless phones. So you take it off the base, you could walk around your house. This was the greatest thing ever. Oh, I remember the days. And... There were two problems. One, microwaves. You strike your microwave and your little phone base is sitting right next to the microwave. Got to heat your burrito. And all of a sudden your, your, your phone call is all staticky and terrible. But more related to networking, directly, I actually had to deal with this in a couple of customers' houses. I owned a consulting company. We did house calls and worked on networks in people's houses. And I was in the house and she's telling me, our wireless network just keeps failing. It just keeps failing. We don't know why. It just keeps failing. We're on it. It's going great and just stops. And I'm in the house troubleshooting testing, checking, websites, pinging, why is this not working? And I hear someone pick up the phone in the house. And it was when 2.4 gigahertz wireless oh, phones, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're on the same phones channel. had they were just on the come same out. Channel. Yeah. And they would turn that phone on and kill the wireless. Yep. So some good stories about, uh, directly in this case, uh, electromagnetic, magnetic, or in that case, the next slide, radio frequency interference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and these are, so we talked about interference generically. Now we're talking about specific types of interference. Yep. So radio frequency interference, uh, AM, FM transmissions, cell phone towers, uh, typically considered part of the EMI family. Uh, filters can be installed on the network to help eliminate signal frequency uh, anyone, being broadcast. Anyone using DSL? You may have seen those little filters they make you put on your... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Because there's actually, in the case of DSL, interestingly, there's interference from the same wire because that wire is carrying two signals. Crosstalk. When the signal that's transmitting on one copper wire or pair of wires creates an undesired effect on another wire or pair of wires. Undesired effect. That sounds so minimal. Oh, look, an undesired effect. How much hair have you pulled out due to crosstalk? Um, 
I don't know. Honestly, it, it comes down to that troubleshooting again. What, and, and unfortunately, when it comes down to interference, you kind of shotgun approach it. There are these 20 things. Okay, let's just go through the list of the big things that could be causing this problem and get rid of them. And you get rid of them and then the problem goes away. You never actually figured out which one it was because you were in a hurry and don't really have a process for one at a time and then test and then one at a time and then test. So probably a fair amount. Well, and the really difficult issues to troubleshoot are the ghosty issues, the intermittent issues. Things like, um, you know, the network's down from seven to nine, three to six. Those, those are a little bit more hard and fast, but say we, we, we talked about the Mac, um, the Mac numbers that were the same, uh, the Mac conflict. That was so ghosty because sometimes a computer would come up and we'd have a class that would use two computers that had the same MAC address, mm -hmm. so it would kick one off. Other times we didn't. So sometimes this would work, sometimes it wouldn't. So those ghosty issues can be really hard to, yeah. to deal with. So crosstalk, uh, we've talked about unshielded twisted pair. Next we have shielded twisted pair. Notice uh, each cable, they're individually wrapped. Uh, Kind of like a candy bar. Sort of. I was actually thinking, as soon as you said individually wrapped, I'm like, mm, I want some candy. Yeah, see, candy bar. See, look at that. We're, we're not only giving people knowledge, we're bringing a little bit of joy into their life. Candy, uh, things that taste good. What more could you want? That's true. We got burritos and candy so far. This yep. is the best class ever. 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 Uh, this, you'll need a little bit more specialized tool to uh, strip and remove, because you not only have to strip the uh, overall cable, you need to strip the shielded components, uh, you need to get the wire. So this can be a little bit more difficult to, um, to deal with. You also need a bigger budget. Yes. It's more expensive and a little bit more difficult to handle. So shielded twisted pair is not terribly common in the world as we know, at least not that I've ever seen. No, I actually, I haven't either. I haven't either. Plenum rated. Plenum rated basically deals with if the cable catches on fire, how much is it going to smoke? How, how much of a toxic cloud is it going to release as it catches on fire? This is stuff uh, for wiring between in walls that you can't really get to. Um, that sprinkler systems that when they flip on, they can't get to it. Uh, so they have a Teflon coating that makes them a little bit more impervious to fire. Uh, used in situations... Uh, because standard twisted pair cables have a PVC jacket, which can emit, like I said, a gas as they get heated up and as they burst into flames and cause problems. Uh, an undesired effect, an as it undesired were. undesired effect. Yeah, we, do, we don't want that. Burning of your network cables. That's right. As a, well, and causing gas and polluting the environment. That's true. Because that's undesired what, that is effect. what I'm going to be worried about while my building's burning down around me. Hope this gas isn't toxic. <laughs> Fiber optic cable transmits light over basically a plastic or glass type wire. So now we have the transmission of light instead of electricity over a cable. Uh, the benefits here that we get, you don't really get any interference unless the cable gets kinked or managed somewhere. Uh, people are unable to snoop uh, fiber optic type network. They're really good for high speed, high distance, um, and high capacity yep. transmission. Uh, when they first came out, people would uh, do these by hand, would do fiber optic by hand. I've heard those stories. So there were there's two cables. There's a send and receive because again, uh, it only goes one way on the channel. So yep. there'd be a send cable and a receive cable. You'd have to very carefully... And this is bundled with all kinds of like Christmas goodies around it. So you have the, the sheath, and then you have a shielding, and then you have a plastic component around that, and then a couple other layers, and then you have the actual core to it. So you would have to snip the cable and kind of get your way through this to the core, and then you would have to burnish the end of the core so you could hook that to a connector to get it to work. Uh, we ha I had somebody in one of my classes bring one of those systems up one time, uh, bring one of those systems in one time. It was really difficult. Mm -hmm. it, it, it definitely was challenging. Uh, but with fiber optic cable, again, high speed, high capacity, 
um, long distance. So, so, so given all that, all I'm hearing is good things. I, my brain wonders, why don't I use this everywhere? Why don't I use this at home if it's so much faster? Why can't I connect all my computers with fiber optic versus these shielded and unshielded twisted pair cables that are subject to interference and crosstalk? Why not just fiber everywhere? That's a really good question. The problem with fiber optic, if you can call it a problem, it's a trade-off, it's very expensive. And I, I'm not quite sure how to say this, but you need a much higher level of skill to deal with it than twisted pair. Twisted pair, I'm not saying that you, a one-armed monkey can do twisted pair. You need a skill set to be able to do, do twisted pair. But the tools needed and the um, skill set needed to deal with fiber optic is just kind of that next level. Okay. I'm, I'm trying to find some costs while we're sitting here talking about trying to find some comparison. I'm thinking about, uh, it's saying about a thousand times. Thousand? The expense is about a thousand times That's a different. big number. Yeah, they're talking about per hundred feet of cable. 100 feet of Cat5, I mean, these days cost you 20 bucks. Exactly. 30. Exactly. You're not going to find fiber. Plus, well, and the cost isn't necessarily the cable, the cost is the, the devices to plug the cable into. Fiber switches are exorbitantly expensive. It's, it's good technology, it's great technology, it has its advantages, it has its speeds, it's expensive. You're going to use it in data centers, you're going to use it as your backbones, you're going to use it as connecting data centers together over large areas. Okay. Uh, so your fiber optic cables, here's your cabling standards, your mediums, and your maximum distances. And I'll preface this slide because when I was in the boat that some of our viewers at this point may be in sitting at home watching this video right now thinking, do I really have to memorize all of those? I think I have yet in all of the certification exams I've taken and all of the networks I've worked on to need to know all of this information. I'm not a fiber optic installer. I'm not, um, I, I'm not in a position or never been in a position where I need to know all of these fiber standards and all of the information that goes along with them. Okay, but, but let's take a look at what we know so far mm -hmm. and take a look at these numbers uh, because we can still get information from this. Because well, and, and if you're a designer, you'll need this. You'll need to know. If you get to the point in your career, you're architecting data centers, you're creating geographically dispersed solutions, you're building backbones for networks, which I never got to the point where, from a networking standpoint, I was building out fiber solutions to connect data centers, so. Well, if we look at these cable standards, uh, before we talked about 10 base T or 100 base T, here we have 100 base FX. So we, although we don't understand these standards per se, we still have information. So 100, so we need, know we're dealing with 100, 100 megabit per second. Yep. Base, so it's a baseband technology, not a broadband technology. Mm -hmm. And FX, okay, so that gives us the idea that, okay, well, it's not a twisted pair thing, mm -hmm. so we need to figure out what that FX thing is. So even though we don't necessarily know these standards directly, we still have information that we can pull from yep. what we have here. Or used to build them. Yes. Like somebody says, what's a fiber standard? Well, I know it's 100 megabit, I know it's baseband fiber FX. Yeah, there you go. So, so far we've talked about our different types of wired networks. Let's talk about wireless networks. You notice that I don't even have to look at the slides now. I, That's I, good. That's my, awesome. Yeah, my presenter skill sets. Like, I think I've gained like another little dot here that I can apply to a skill set. There you go. Your, your presenter skill set has gone up one. Ding. Sweet. Now I don't have to look at the slides anymore and I can move that over. Although periodically, if you see me look down like this or if you see me look right there, I'm looking at slides. So wireless networks. So basically we've talked about wired networks. Uh, the device is physically connected by wire of some kind, by a physical medium of some kind to the hub switch router. Wireless, remember we talked about wireless access points. Wireless allows a device, smartphone, tablet, uh, laptop, whatever, to connect to a network with no physical media. So it enables connection without a wire, or it enables connection without wiring, uh, provides a degree of portability, uh, extends connectivity to pre existing wireless networks. As Christopher and I talked about earlier, uh, wireless networks don't typically stand alone, they're typically an additive portion of a wired network. So I have my wired network. And then I have wireless components to my wired network. Yep. 
Uh, some wireless devices can be connected directly to each other, point to point. Wireless network adapters. So whether it's a wireless system or a wired system, we still need the ability to connect to the network itself. And that's where these wireless network adapters come in. Uh, again, they allow connectivity between your device and the network, and they come in a variety of shapes and sizes. Uh, USB, PC card, internal PC, PC Express adapter card, numerous types of adapters. Simple phone, built in right here. There we go. As Christopher, Christopher's showing his phone right now. There, uh, is, there is a wireless adapter. There are actually two wireless adapters, one for the network for the cell provider and one as an actual Wi-Fi adapter. Okay, so really good example of a device that connects to the network uh, that has multiple connections in it, uh, the phone connection, the wireless connection. Uh, I can pull information down, it becomes a client. I can push information up, or somebody can request service from it. I can text, uh, and again, all this happens seamlessly on the client. Wireless access point. So again, it enables wireless devices to connect to the network. Uh, they can also act as a router, firewall, and IP proxy. So basically we have the gra graphic representation for a wireless portion of the network. And here we have some lights showing uh, the use WLAN, it's a wireless G, um, and, it's, ooh, and we're connected to the internet. Yep. So, the fact that we see that this is wireless and it's connected to the internet, what do we know about this device? Um, well, this is very similar to what we talked about earlier as the kind of new definition of router or almost the consumer version of a router where it's gonna serve multiple functions. It's gonna connect those ethernet ports. That means there's cables plugged into this. It's connecting my wired devices and my wireless devices both together and out to the internet. Okay, so this might be a switch it might be a router. So again, a device that has multiple functionality yep. to it. Oh, and because it uh, connects wireless to wired, it's a bridge. Yep. Wireless modes, uh, different modes to connect to a wireless network infrastructure, uh, wireless clients connect to and are authenticated by a WAP, a wireless access point or ad hoc, used when all the clients communicate directly with each other. And, and I don't know if some people know this or some people don't know this, that similar to a computer at your house, you don't have to have a hub or a switch to get your computers to talk to each other. We mentioned creating a cable that's got the wires reversed on one end. You can plug that crossover cable into both of your devices and they'll communicate with each other. With wireless devices, if I have a laptop and a tablet and a phone at my house, I can set those up to be ad hoc and they'll connect to each other without the use of a central wireless device. What benefit do I get having that central wireless device? Um, centralized manage, centralized security, centralized connectivity outward. Uh, if you've got these three devices in ad hoc mode, you have no connectivity outside of those three devices. They can talk to each other, but that's it. A centralized access point or router will allow you to connect to the internet, connect to a wired network elsewhere on location in your LAN. It will also allow you to to centralize security policy, the encryption that happens during the wireless communication, which is a big issue that we're gonna talk about in a minute as well. Okay. Wireless LAN, uh, again, composed of at least one WAP, wireless access point, and a computer or handheld device that connect to the WAP. Uh, devices are ethernet based, but built on other networking architectures. Again, what we're kind of reinforcing here is the fact that wireless networks don't stand on their own. Mm -hmm. Most of the time. Uh, ensure compatibility, the WAP and other wireless devices must all use the same IEEE 802.11 standard. That one's mostly true. What you do get is you get devices that will be backwards compatible. You may have a wireless access point that supports 802.11a and b and g all at the same time. So I can connect any of those three types of devices to one central device. But in, in this sense, that the, the access point and the endpoint device both have to subscribe to A. Correct. 802.11a or 802.11b. You just make it devices that support more than one at a time. And then wireless fidelity, Wi-Fi, this is what people are most familiar with, is a trademark 
to brand products that belong to the cat a category of WLAN devices. Other wireless devices include a wireless repeater and a wireless bridge. A wireless repeater is basically used to extend signal. Uh, a wireless signal only goes so far, uh, typically about 100 feet or so, uh, depending on the environment, well, maybe a bit longer, maybe a bit shorter. A lot shorter. <laughs> yeah, you have it in your house, and you notice that sometimes you put it in areas of the house that it doesn't work that well. You put it in other areas of the house, it works better. Typically, in the house, higher is better, I found. Yeah. Uh, so wireless repeater extends coverage. Wireless bridge. Uh, bridge can connect different 802.11 standards together. Uh, as Christopher mentioned earlier, wireless A, wireless B, G, N, allowing interconnection. Yep. Uh, so we've talked about a switch, a hub, a bridge, a router. And again, don't be confused by the fact that a lot of the times consumer devices, you'll see that they're a mixture or hybrid of device. So if you go out specifically looking for a bridge device and don't see it, uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing. That just means, hey, you know, that possibly incorporated into that router that you're looking at or that switch that you're looking at. So as you buy a device, ensure that you're really, that you look at what's included in the device, what functionality well, is included. And by definition, they don't really use the term bridge anymore. Bridges were, by definition, ways to connect different types of media. So you'd have coax on one end and cat5 on the other. Um, with a wireless access point, it is a bridge. It has to be because you're connecting that wireless client to a wired network. Your media is different on either side of that device. They've just kind of lumped that term into or that functionality into no, number, numerous other devices. Right. So again, we're back to standards. So our WLAN standards include 802.11. And 802.11, the IEEE 802.11, is wireless. And then within that, there's different categorizations of wireless. And then you see here, A is 54 megabits per second, B, 11, G, 54, 11N, ooh, 600, woo, ding, ding. Uh, and then they work at different frequencies. And what we don't have on this table, because you kind of wonder why was A, 54, and B dropped down to 11, and then G came back up to 54, a lot of this was a distance thing. They had 54 megabits per second, but it was very short range. They went with B, they had to slow it down, but they got exponentially more range out of it. Then with G, they were able to take that same range and bring that 54 megabits per second back out that distance. And now it's just taken off and we're getting faster and farther and bigger and better. And I don't have 2.4 gigahertz wireless so that it won't interfere with my wireless mouse and keyboard, right. which most people may not know is an issue. Let me look real quick. Let me see if this is, this just says wireless. I'd have to actually tear it apart a little bit to see if it's, if it's a 2.4 gigahertz device that might actually mess with my wireless network. Uh, again, interference and in things that we may or may not think about, which would give you the opportunity to troubleshoot. Opportunity indeed. <laughs> Wireless encryption options. So let's go back to the postcard analogy. Uh, I'm sending information to Christopher. I'm using postcards to do it. I have my 10 page report. I've cut it up. I put it on the postcards. Well, you know, if you're familiar with postcards, anybody who picks that postcard up can read it. So if I can gain access to the postcard, I can read it. Networking standards are the same, typically without encryption. As this data goes over the wire, anybody who can gain access to the data can read it. And remember with the hub, that information is broadcast everywhere. So if I can pull that data out, I have the opportunity to read that. Yep. Now, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's the gist of it. So with wireless uh, being as easy access it is, as it is, that's kind of the double-edged sword. Um, and, and let's kind of step back a minute and talk about security at a really high level. Security and networking kind of doesn't go together because the, the idea of networking is to give people information. Get it all out there. Get, to give people access to information. The idea behind security is to keep people away from information. So they kind of don't go together. So security when it comes to networking is a little bit different. Security when it comes to networking is ensuring those that need access to the data have continued access. 
those that aren't supposed to have access to the data don't have access. So with that in mind, uh, there are wireless encryption options. If we look at the chart here, we see our wireless encryption protocols, WEP, Wired Equivalent Privacy, WPA and WPA2, Wi-Fi Protected Access, and notice the different encryption level key sizes on the right-hand side. Uh, so one thing that you do need to do is ensure that your wireless access points and your wireless devices use the same encryption option. Yep. Service set identifier. Service set identifier, typically known as the SSID, is what you associate to a wired network. Uh, this is typically the name of the wired wireless network. Uh, kind of browsing around the, web, ah, around the web and looking at different stuff. One of my favorite SSIDs that I saw, FBI surveillance van. Tell me that's not going to make your neighbors that's nervous seeing my, something like that. My last apartment uh, neighbor, some of my neighbors had that as their as their SSID. See, not only technical, not only technical, but fun. Absolutely. So now, when a client wants to connect to the network, they need to know that name, that that friendly name or unfriendly name, depending on how you associate it. How your sense of humor works. Yeah. Exactly. You could go back to the hexadecimal bad beef. Um, so there, there's different things that you can do. But as a device connecting to this uh, wireless network, they need to know the SSID. Uh, for security purposes, the SSID could be um, hidden, so not broadcast. Typically, it's just broadcast. Uh, as you've gone into like Starbucks or uh, different areas that have free Wi-Fi, I don't know why I'm air quoting free Wi-Fi, but they have free Wi-Fi, uh, you'll, you'll see on your device, you'll pull it up and it'll say, hey, can connect to, maybe it's Starbucks, can connect to Starbucks. That's their SSID. And they've allowed that to be broadcast so you can connect to it. Uh, some people don't want their SSID broadcast, at which point you have to know it directly to gain connection to it. Although nowadays you can get teased. A lot of wireless devices, the endpoints, phones, tablets, laptops, will show you all of the networks that have SSIDs you can connect to. And some of them will show you all of the networks you can't connect to. It'll just say unidentified network, unidentified network, unidentified network, just to tease you. These are networks you can't connect to, but they're here. Yeah. So you know, someone's yeah. trying to hide something. Not for you. I don't, don't want to see that. It Not for you. I want to figure it out. Yeah. So wireless settings. So basically what we see here are different things that we would set up as we set up a wireless access point. Uh, notice enable wireless, yes or no, the wireless network name, so the SSID, mm -hmm. uh, 802.11 mode that we talked about, AGN. Uh, some devices, you don't have to figure this out, they'll arbitrate automatically, so as the device connects, it'll arbitrate. Uh, enable auto channel scan, so we've talked about what gigahertz is it going to uh, be at? It can basically do different channels. Uh, what wireless channel, what transmission rate, uh, the channel width. So you have some uh, different things that you can configure. The security mode, this is where WEP or WPA, you'd configure that information. Use, by the way, just a little helpful pointer, always WPA, always. Um, WEP, we won't actually bring any up, but if you do a search using any search engine for Crack WEP takes about five, six minutes. Oh. So use WPA all the time. How did we get to the summary already? What happened here? How did, how do we, we're having such a good time. We keep forgetting that the end of these modules keeps coming up. This, this makes me a little sad that we're through this material already. Oh yeah? Yeah, it does, it I does. Think we, I think we can come up with some more for you. For you and for the audience. I think they want more as well. I, I'm ready, but let's, let's wrap this one up before we talk about more. Fair enough. So, summary. Uh, to recognize wired networks and media types, uh, and includes identifying twisted pair cables, cabling tools, and testers. So basically really understanding the wired network, the media type, and the tools needed to configure the wired network. Yep. 
And then basically to comprehend, that's a really good word, to comprehend wireless networks. Uh, so understanding wireless devices, wireless settings, configurations, standards, and encryption protocols. Yep. Once again, I get to do my little additional resources. Our book, MTA Networking Fundamentals, Microsoft Official Academic Curriculum, uh, available for purchase just about anywhere. A number of instructor-led courses, if you like what you're seeing here, in fact, this is a good module for this because what we do is we talk about it. We show you some, some images, we create some graphics, and we talk about what we're going over in terms of the topic. In one of those instructor-led courses, at least if they're one of my instructor-led courses, you're going to get to come to class and you're going to play with this stuff. I'm going to have a box of cables and crimpers and strippers, and we're going to tear some cables apart and make some more. Well, I like these videos, but what if I have a question? What, what if I want to ask the instructor a question? Oh, I, I still might ignore you. That's hurtful. Well, it depends on how good an instructor you are, I guess, maybe. <laughs> I don't know whether ignoring students makes you a good or bad instructor, honestly. I guess it depends on the class. But yeah, you get to talk to people face-to-face. -face. And, and one of the things I think a lot of students miss or, or overlook beforehand, before they've taken some courses, is it's not just the instructor. You're going to be in a course with other people in the same position, learning the same things. Or in some cases, you're going to be in a course with somebody who's been in IT for 20 years and is learning something new. And they may have things they can teach you right then, sitting next to you at a desk that you'd never learn on your own. Or asking questions about things you've never thought about yep. or that help you, stimulate you to think about other things. Absolutely. So a lot of advantages to instructor-led courses. Um, I used to do courses where we would break things, like intentionally, like hammers, hard drives, snapping cables, and breaking connectors off. And they were fun classes. So... That's a nice advantage for this module because we looked at tools and media where you'd actually maybe go to a course and get to play with that. Well, yeah, and get, be able to get some hands-on with yep. those. So I'm really a fan of this uh, Microsoft Virtual Academy, this online learning, uh, accessibility to knowledge. I, I think that's great. Uh, but there may be some people who find the classroom environment just a little bit more helpful for them. So I... I wouldn't dissuade anybody who's like taken this video or, or watched a couple of these videos to not take a course. Take a course. I mean, you might get a lot out of it. Uh, take a course on something. Maybe you've gone through one of the MVA modules and were like, hey, I'd like to gain more information about that. Or, okay, so I have a pretty good idea about this. I want to learn about these other things uh, more in depth. And so take a class. I, I, I'm a huge proponent of going in and getting classroom learning. Well, I'm too. We're, I'm, I'm in the business. So yeah, take courses. It's kind of what we do. My job depends on it. <laughs> take some courses. Uh, and last, the exam, the certification we're here to prepare for. So exam 98-366, networking fundamentals. And I think that pretty much wraps us for this one. I think that wraps up this module. It Again, does. It we've, does we've had a really good time. Well, at least you and I have had a good time. Hopefully, <laughs> I don't they've... know about them. I think we offended them at least once talking about cutting up their cables. But uh... well, no, I, I'm I'm less concerned with behind the camera than I'm concerned with watching the video. Well, I'm telling the students that they they have to watch out for offending people too now because we're giving them bad ideas. If they're sitting at home watching this video, like, oh hey, there's this network cable right here. I'm just gonna reach down here and. I can just cut this off and see what that looks like. Of course, what's going to happen is the video is going to stop. <laughs> and now once the video stopped, we're not going to be able to teach you how to fix it. How to fix it. So you can just sit there with a broken cable and just try and figure it out for yourself. So have fun with that. Yeah. Good luck, and uh, hopefully we'll see you real soon.